Good morning, good morning. Welcome to this uh, Zoom service of First Presbyterian Church of Oakland. So glad that you are here. Just a gentle reminder to uh, keep yourself muted. Um, there, I think there's a few of you. One day we'll figure out how to line this up so you come in muted rather than come in uh, with your sound on. But if you are not muted, please mute yourself. Um, we will follow a uh, Typical order of worship, as we have been doing for weeks and weeks, prayers and songs and liturgy, scripture, sermon. I actually love this. Parts of this Zoom service is that I feel like I also get to be head usher as I see you all coming in the waiting room um, and admitting you. It is fun to see your names and uh, as God gathers us. Um, we will uh, have times where you can unmute yourself and share. You can also type in the chat room. 
um, use that as a way to reach out to each other, to lift up prayers. I know uh, that there are several gardeners in our midst. Um, I am currently getting my vegetable garden ready as well. That's the time of year when you pull out all the old stuff, um, lament that you have to pull out the last of the winter vegetables or spring and head into summer. But I'd like to think of this worship space um, as a God as a gardener and that we are in this space and that God comes to uh, maybe to fertilize us, maybe to prune off some things, uh, maybe to water us, help us grow. Uh, but come this morning expecting God's spirit to meet us in what we need as a community to guide us. Um, may we be uh, open to that as we have grace for one another. Let me pray for us. God, we give you thanks for this morning. Give you thanks that we can uh, see each other's faces, read each other's names, that we can gather as your church community safely in the midst of this pandemic. We come with expectation, expectation of your comforts, of your teaching, of your guiding, of your forming us as your church. May we be open and ready for that this morning. Amen. We gather to seek asylum from a world that sets neighbor against neighbor. We gather to seek asylum from the temptations to draw and enforce boundaries. That mean we can describe other people as not our problem. We gather to seek asylum from a worldview that values us primarily as consumers, as wealth generators as units of production and consumption. We gather to seek asylum from the binaries that bind and constrain us. We gather to seek asylum from the very church in whose name we gather. An, orthodox, an orthodoxy and hierarchy have been tools of oppression and abuse. We name ourselves as asylum seekers. We pray that in our seeking, we may create asylum for which we yearn. We pray, starting here, starting now, our seeking may crack open the empires that we resist and turn away from so that the world, that the whole world may be transformed into a place of safe asylum for all. Please join me as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy.
It's called to confession. O thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls, and minds. We have not loved our neighbors as Christ loved us. We have too often lived by our own selfish impulses rather than by the light of sacrificial love as revealed by Christ. We often give in order to receive. We love our friends and hate our enemies. We go the first mile but not dare travel the second. We forgive but dare not forget. And so as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that the history of our lives is the history of eternal revolt against thee. But thou, O God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we could have been, but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know thy will. Give us the courage to do thy will. Give us the devotion to love thy will. In the name of the spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please take a moment for silent confession. The spirit abides each of us, loving us, loving through us, forgiving us, and forgiving through us. We are loved and forgiven, even as we love and forgive. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Hani. We now uh, have the opportunity. Two of our members are going to share. Um, I think Bill Coburn is going to be first, but we're going to have a new section uh, just during the month of May where we uh, give testimonies a little bit to help us reflect as a community upon the pandemic and the questions that we've given uh, Bill and Leah, and they can choose any of these questions, but what have they learned about themselves in this pandemic? What have they learned about God? Uh, what practices have they leaned on that they would like to continue um, in the uh, months ahead? I know we're not at the end of the pandemic. I'm not declaring that. It does feel like a little bit of a new season we're headed into. So it's just to help us be reflecting on that as a community. Uh, but why don't you uh, share now, Bill? No, thank you, Matt. Uh, our family has always heard, God has always spoken to us. My my to myself, to my wife, to Sue, and our children. And uh, we have, even before the pandemic, uh, God doesn't speak to us in English. He, uh, he gets us at the 
it gets us in our stomach and grips us and we feel very strongly the word of god who told us you should go feed people and you should uh this is the right thing to do this is what scripture tells us to do and this is what we need to teach our children as we move forward so for many years we've done that uh, starting with the simplest act of making peanut butter sandwiches taking them out to the street and sharing them with people very simple act but one which has all the elements of doing good carrying out the work of jesus christ over the years and it's been maybe 15 years that we've continued with this work in a slightly more organized way god has continued to tell us this is the right thing to do uh, we have a we have had a family member who has been struggling with the kinds of issues which many people do who are out on the street it just uh, gripped us even more closely in, to carry out this work and then the pandemic comes along and uh, all i can say is god again not in english but he grips grips us in the deepest pit of our stomach and said you have to continue with this work yes there are challenges but look at the need out there figure it out so uh, here we are we figured it out we lost so much but we gained so much from this we are the program at first at first prez with the support of so many people feeds twice the number of people we have we have freezers full of food refrigerators full of food we have volunteers willing to do this even in this awkward pandemic stage uh, it's been a miracle and it's been felt so deeply by us uh, we had a, a volunteer yesterday uh, who expressed this very beautifully as during this pandemic phase we've had ourselves as christians we've had uh, several jewish temples participate with us we've had many people who are actually maybe not even to find themselves as christians uh, help us we've had muslim groups help us and uh, one gal yesterday emailed me said we're all a community it doesn't we'll we'll make this work somehow so this is the the modus operandi that that we are using uh thanks be to god so we look forward to the future as we see the end of the pandemic coming we see some changes in our program we see some new possibilities we don't know exactly what the answer is but uh, god is also speaking to us and saying don't give this up don't relax there's so much need out there you can do it figure out a way so that's what we'll be doing uh, thanks be to god Amen. Thank you for sharing, Bill. We also have Leah is going to be sharing with us. Hi. Um, as most of you know me, I have presented and read the scriptures and helped um, reading and leading worship or singing Oceans with Alessandra. But none of you really know me on a more personal, like, level so i decided to share today um, about my experience with covid so corona has definitely uh been full of really high highs and quite low lows but it's a once in a lifetime experience and i'm kind of glad to be able to say i'm living through it starting off with the lows i've been through a quite dramatic friend situation where i lost some of the people that i thought were supposed to have my back it's not something I really want to go into depth as of right now because it's still quite fresh, but I was very hurt and ended up missing an entire week of school and it was hard to like get through the day. Um, but I was lucky to have my mom by me the entire way and she supported me and soon sports started and so I threw myself into sports. Uh, soccer mainly because most of my friends were in frisbee so I was trying to avoid frisbee because uh, awkward <laughs> but uh, I threw myself into school and sports and it slowly got easier to manage and deal with um, but I've returned to frisbee now it's been a couple months uh, but 
it's still hard because every time I feel like I'm okay with the situation, else comes up that brings it all back again. And it's, it's hard to manage. So that's something. Um, but if it wasn't for Corona, uh, I don't, I think it might have been easier to resolve this and get out of a toxic friendship like that. But it does, it did teach me um, how to like more signs and how to realize stuff like that. Um, something else I have realized is how like hard and annoying social media can be because everything you do on social media has strings attached to it. Everyone's watching you, everyone's perceiving you, like, like everyone's judging you. It constantly feels like that. Um, so yeah, uh, I've ended up deleting social media a bunch of times, to, uh, sometimes all my apps, sometimes certain apps. As of right now, I do have Instagram because it helps me keep in touch with so many people from my family in Mexico to elementary school friends and friends that I don't see too often. So that's nice. Um, and I've been trying to figure out how I connect with God and I've been coming to services. I actually recently joined the uh, worship planning committee on Mondays with Pastor Matt, my mom and Di and Aaron and Linda, and usually sometimes the worship leader of the week. Um, and it's kind of like a mini Bible study for this passage that we're reading for Sundays. And it's been fun to uh, deal with it in a more adult situation because uh, I think adults share out more and have like more opinions because like when I do it with teenagers or like um, youth group, I think a lot of us are scared to share our ideas. So it's an interesting environment. Um, and I'm constantly looking how to understand and figure out like what my connection is with God and post COVID I'm excited to look into confirmation classes and work with that. Um, and so my teenage years are supposed to be the years where I can explore and try different things. But with COVID, that's been especially hard. Um, but COVID has also given me the unique chance to challenge myself to come up with creative and safe ways that I can spend time with my friends. I've had campouts in my backyard. We've gone over to my neighbor's house and roasted s'mores and stayed up really late. <laughs> um, I've had countless amount of art projects, um, painting. My friend and I last summer decided to make a card game and paint a deck of 52 cards. Although we only got to painting seven, it was a good idea. <laughs> but um, I, something else I've discovered that I really like to do is photography. And I've taken my friends out on photo shoots and I've gone up to sunsets. And so earlier this year, I bought my uh, camera from my brother for $300, which is quite a lot for my age because I'm not really making money. But um, I'm going to share my screen with some photos that I have taken. Um, so this is just a flower that I, me and my friends go on walks, so I take nature photos. Um, and then this is my friend, best friend, Sarah. I've known her since third grade and I use her as my model a lot. <laughs> uh, this is my other friend, Phoebe. I met her um, ninth grade and she's been a really supportive friend. Uh, this is around Christmas time. So we like the Christmas lights. Um, this is my next door neighbor, Max. He brings a lot of joy to me. Uh, as of yesterday, since I'm vaccinated and their family's vaccinated, I got to hang out with him and his older sister all day long. And it was like the first normal thing in quite some time. And it was just really fun and joyful. Um, uh, I woke up at six in the morning uh, or like 5.30 in the morning to see the sunrise with a bunch of friends. So this is a sunrise photo. This is my friend running into the sunrise. It was quite tiring. This is a photo of my brother surfing. He discovered surfing over Corona and uh, he's taken me and I've taken some lessons with him. And so this is a photo of him surfing. This is my mom. Um, I just really like the birds and the, like kind of aesthetic of it. This is at Stinson Beach when we went for a weekend. Um, and this is the beach. I don't know, I seem to find like God in like these 
beautiful like moments when you're just looking out at the world and it's super surreal. And this is one photo that reminds me of that. Um, but yeah, thank you for letting me share with you guys today. Man, thank you, Leah, for sharing. We'll have a brief, some of those brief testimonies uh, each week. If you would like to be a person that would share, we're still looking for some more volunteers. If you have an email in your inbox from Julia asking you to share, you can respond to it uh, and they'll be one of our people, but to help us be reflecting on um, what God is doing in our life. These don't have to be uh, wrapped up. We don't have to be at the end of that. We could just be asking questions, but may we be reflecting as a community. Now is a chance for us to lift up prayers as a community. Uh, we can lift up things that we are thankful for, joyful for, as well as those who need prayers in our midst, in our community, in the world. You can type those in the chat, or you can uh, speak them out loud. You can uh, press the raise your hand thing, or just raise your hand in front of your uh, video, and I'll call on you. Yeah, Dory. Uh, yes, I'd like prayers for my daughter and her family. Yesterday, they had to put their 16-year-old dog to sleep, and it's been really hard. Thank you. So we lift up prayers for Dory's daughter and their family in this loss. Any others? Thankfully, I can't see both screens, so if I don't, you could unmute yourself. I'd like to say something yeah please i as bad as uh this whole covid crisis has been it's uh it's a good thing i believe in a sense that uh in my opinion it's reinforced what's important mm -hmm. when you're locked indoors you can't go anywhere it really doesn't matter how much money you have the things you have because you couldn't use them and what really mattered was family, either direct or your community. And those people that really mean something to you. And there was a one, this crisis has been a wonderful opportunity to reconnect, to settle old uh, debts, uh, and just to sh share, share and show love to people that you probably would not have even thought of if uh, life was normal. And so, I, uh, I'm grateful for the positives that's come out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. We should, we should sign you up for one of the other testimonies as well, if you want to join. <laughs> uh, Gay lifts up prayers for uh, Harold Green coming out of the hospital. We lift up prayers for his healing. I want to lift up prayers for the family of Mario Gonzalez. He was killed by the Alameda police several weeks ago. Um, so we lift up prayers for his family and prayers for accountability. Yeah, Margie. Yeah, prayers of gratitude for the food com committee for reaching out to our son, Jason. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you saw and get the weekly emails, um, it was a uh, Feels like a divine moment, but some of the meals went out from the food ministry and uh, found Jason through one of the volunteers. And so then there was a picture shared um, to Margie and Eric and others um, of Jason. So we continue to lift up prayers for his, his health and safety and for the ministry. Uh, Matt, prayers for Eric Bevington, who's with his dad at the moment in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I think his dad's back in hospital. Okay, so we lift up prayers for Eric's dad. Um, last I heard from him, it wasn't uh, as bad as they thought, but maybe he is back in again. So we lift up prayers for his healing. Eric went there suddenly to watch over him. Uh, in the chat, Louise uh, raised prayers for the people of India. And I second for all of the parts of the world that are um, not on the improving swing that we seem to be here. Yeah, yeah. We lift that up and recognize them. Susanna, did you have other? Um, yeah, I was um, going to give thanks for uh, Monrovia and I went to her friend's bat mitzvah yesterday and it was a very beautiful uh, service um, and it was just powerful to me. Um, this is the second bat mitzvah we've gone to in COVID for one of her friends and um, in both of them just um, hearing God's words 
as they read different passages of the Torah and making, uh, it, it just is powerful to um, be reminded of some of the passages from the Old Testament that I don't always dwell on. Um, so it, it was beautiful to hear her speaking those words in Hebrew and just also to be reminded of um, God's goodness through many seasons. Um, the second thing is we asked for prayer last week for our friends, Kim and Jeremy, whose um, house was in a fire and they'll be displaced for the next or so. So continued prayers for them. And she, uh, our friend Kim is a pastor in San Diego. And so prayers for her as she navigates pastoring um, her Presbyterian church there and also uh, working on rebuilding their home. Mm -hmm. Lift up prayers for her. Yeah, Minervia. Um, I pray for um, times when I can have social interactions with friends, like um, the party I went to yesterday. That was nice, and I got to see people I don't get to see that often, and like reconnect. Minrovia is in the reception room there, as you can tell with the echo. Um, she came for the food ministry, but she lifts up prayers for opportunities for uh, social uh, safe social times with her. There is David as well. He came in to volunteer for the food ministry. So if you, uh, it's a little plug, if you desire to volunteer, you can come in on Sunday morning. You can get communion in person maybe as well. <laughs> Others who lift up prayers or concerns, joys this morning. Let us close in prayer. Bex, you can share. We have a new version of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to actually have just to have some moments of silence, and then we'll pray this version of the Lord's Prayer together. My assumption is that uh, these prayers that we've lifted up, that we've written in the chats, uh, I will pray them throughout the week, but my assumption is that we will hold them up as a community. We will always be praying for them and even listening as whatever sense, whether you hear that in your body or in a voice as Bill does to, to lead to action, but many times our prayers uh, God invites us to be the answer to those prayers. So let us uh, pray them in silence, and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Oh God. You love us like a good parent and are present in every aspect of our existence. May your nature become known and respected by all. May your joy, peace, wholeness, and justice be the reality for everyone as we live by the Jesus way. Give us all that we already need to live every day for you, that we really need to live every day for you. And forgive us our failures as we forgive others for their failures. Keep us from doing those things which are not of you and cause us always to be centered on your love. For you are the true reality in this our now and in all our future. In the Jesus way we pray, amen. Please join with me now as we sing praise to God who reigns above. <laughs>
Today's reading is from Mark. On the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God and when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the priests, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, he gave them some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. And the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure the man on the Sabbath and that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save life or to kill, but they were silent. He looked around them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of their hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out immediately and conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Amen. Amen. We will have a question at the end of the sermon. I'm just going to just for the I know there's different levels of how we respond uh, to the scripture as the spirit leads us, but it will be wondering how each of you practices the Sabbath. What uh, we will learn from the scripture, but wondering what helps you to live into the Sabbath, um, what uh, encourages you um, in, the, in a day of rest. As you know, if uh, we have I'm thinking of a lection close by. Um, I keep asking people who is gonna run as the new mayor of Oakland when that comes up. Uh, I have not got many answers from people, but I'm guessing it is gonna be someone that has not been mayor before, uh, maybe has not been on city council. And when that happens, whenever there is a new politician, uh, we all know what happens, don't we? Uh, the journalists go out and try to find everything about this person. Um, it's supposed to be a get to know you thing, but many times they go out and find uh, any mishaps, any mishaps, uh, any problematic things in their history. Uh, so Jesus is much like that. Jesus is new on the scene. Remember, Jesus is way up in Galilee in the northern parts of the country, and he is uh, in his ministry here in the Gospel of Mark. This is the very beginning. He's already got into a couple conflicts, but the Pharisees are checking things out. They're trying to catch him slipping. They want to know uh, how he messes up, what he is about, what his disciples are about. Uh, the Pharisees are one, as we remember, one of the religious political parties at the time. They've been around for a couple hundred years. Um, they don't have any official authority to make laws, uh, but they were highly respected, especially by ordinary people, that they knew how to practice the faith. If I had a question about the faith, if I had a question about the Sabbath, if I have a question about uh, some offering or ritual, I'd go to the Pharisees and they would know the right answer because they were all about it, trying to be holy and trying to keep people in line. So here they find Jesus uh, harvesting on the Sabbath. I think you were allowed to eat on the Sabbath, but you weren't allowed to do work, right? And they were considering picking this grain as his disciples working. Here Jesus uh, makes a big provocative declaration. It is a little hard to miss unless you read the Hebrew scriptures a lot, unless you read the Old Testament a lot. Uh, Jesus is making himself much like David, right? David was uh, in this story from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures. David had been anointed king. He was supposed to be the king, uh, but Saul was still the king, and Saul wanted to kill David, and David was on the run. So he was on the run with his band of 
uh, Mary, whatever, how do you call them? Uh, the group of people with him, the other soldiers, they were on the run and they needed food. So they snuck in and ate the holy bread. And so Jesus here is declaring himself much. He's declaring himself, I'm like your favorite king who was on the run that no one recognized, that no one recognized that he was the king. I am like that. Um, here Jesus equating himself with David, right? The beloved ruler of the nation of Israel. He even uses the term for himself, the son of man. That term is taken from the prophet Daniel, the seventh chapter of Daniel. Son of man being a title for the Messiah that would come, the chosen one who was coming, the one who would bring heaven and earth together, the one that would bring the kingdom of God in a new way. And so here Jesus is in multiple ways that were provocatively and instantly understood in the first century, more difficult today, and this is always difficult as we read the Bible, but Jesus declaring himself, I am that special one. I am that one that you have been waiting for. And even how you are trying to catch me, you're trying to get me, I'm going to use the history of our people and show who I am, what is happening. I love the line, especially as we think of our own practice of Sabbath. Uh, how do we do this as Christians, as people following in the ways of Jesus? He says that the Sabbath was made as a gift. Uh, my interpretation, the Matt Prince interpretation would be the Sabbath is a gift for humankind. Right? It is not supposed to be forced upon you, but it is a gift for us to receive, to enjoy, to celebrate, and not the gift that you pretend that it is nice. Maybe that's how you are right now. Sometimes we receive gifts and you think, I already have this gift. I didn't really want this. You don't really know me. And so you, uh, we are presently teaching our daughters about this, that they can be kind when they receive a gift, even if it is not the exact gift they want. We all know it's a learning lesson. But here, I think Jesus was a belief that all humans, all people can be benefit from a day of rest, from a day that is different, from a day that is set apart. How do we show up and enjoy that gift? For some of us, that gift may be still on the shelf. Maybe, maybe it's on the porch being dropped off by the Amazon delivery, and we do not know it's there. But that gift, for some of us, we may have opened that gift, and we enjoy it every week the gift of being able to reflect and pray and have a different space in our lives. To me, this next passage, naturally, Mark has combined them. They are both about Sabbath, and we head into another Sabbath. It's a Sabbath practice that the people in the first century, Jewish folks, would gather together, right, be together in the synagogue. All these rules and regulations were around the Sabbath, all with good intentions, right? All trying to help people to practice the Sabbath. So there was part of it was legal rules and then part of it was just the social pressure of those around them not to get caught, right? You don't want anyone to be seeing you not doing the Sabbath. You don't want your neighbors to be talking about you, right? So you would practice the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was a very distinctive practice because the Jewish people, as well as a few other practices, it was once something that their neighbors did not do. I think their neighbors at this time would think it was ridiculous, a waste of time, a waste of money. You could get so much done if you work seven days rather than six days. Just think if the crops were in the field and you let them stay there, right? Why not work seven days straight? You can rest later. But it was a distinct practice as the people of God, as they were supposed to be a light to the nations, a light to go out to all. And by these practices, they would show who they are, show the life that God desired, show who God was in the world. We know some of the Jewish nation at this time in the first century, and we see this through reading the Gospels, some had started to equate the being the light to the nation, being that we're the light and everyone else is the darkness. There can be a mixture, and we know this in our own day and age, a mixture of religion and nationalism happens very quickly. There are many who equate right, Christianity with America in our own day and age, religion and, that, and nationalism mixed together. There was some of the same of that happening in first century Palestine. Right? The practice of Sabbath would show that we are light and goodness and the rest of you are all darkness and bad, rather than being a light, almost an invitation to this goodness and this hope. There is a bit of a parallel here where you would try to out uh, practice each other in the Sabbath. Look what I don't do on the Sabbath. I'm even better than you. I'm going to try this even more. Right? There's probably some of this uh, calling out or canceling each other in the midst of this who is in and who is out with Sabbath practice. 
it is clear to me that these these two passages show uh, show Jesus breaking in as the kingdom of God, show the Messiah, show who Jesus is by his reinterpretation, right, re-understanding of what the Sabbath is. It is also clear to me to listen to the frustration of Jesus. He is frustrated by their rules and traditions. And it is easy to point fingers and look at others in the first century, but we have plenty of rules and traditions in our own day and age. We, I know we have them in the church. I am new to learn them here at First Press. I know each church I have ever been at, there has been rules and traditions to try to help us be faithful people of God. But there are times that they get in the way. There are times that we miss out on something that God may be doing. I know the Presbytery of San Francisco is speaking about us coming back into worship spaces as restarting congregations, not just going back to the new normal. How do we restart, think things new? One of my friends, Dave Clute, is the pastor of Open Door uh, Church uh, in the East Bay, and he continually is wondering and pondering if these pandemics only come once every hundred years, what does that mean in terms of how we may change, how we may end up something different on the other side? Wouldn't it be a shame if this, at the other side of this, we were exactly the same as we were before? To, to, for him, it is an invitation. I think is also an invitation for you and I to be looking at our lives individually, as groups, as a church. How may we be invited to new practices on the other side? I fully believe that, and I like the line from our uh, call to worship about not just being producers and consumers of goods. I believe that the Sabbath practice is deeply challenging to our economic system, which is all about how much we can buy and sell and produce and make. It is all around us. We know at the beginning of pandemic when there wasn't buying and selling, right? Because we couldn't be near each other. The economy went way down, right? Almost crashing down, the effects of slowdown. I believe that the Sabbath practice is an invitation for us to think of our priorities, to think of what is important in our lives. One guide that I've received over the years about Sabbath is that there's two passages, and one in Exodus and the other in Deuteronomy, where it, it lists the Ten Commandments and it talks about Sabbath. And in each of those passages, they give different rationale. One of them says, you should practice the Sabbath and remember that God is creator. Remember that God is a good God who made beautiful things and made the world as it should be. God of creation, to reflect upon that creation, be thankful for that creation. I know many of you have practices of walking, of hiking, of being outside. Been one of the spaces that we've been able to go to be apart from each other. One way that we can reflect on God's creation. The other in Deuteronomy, when it lists the commandment, it talks about God's liberation. It talks about the God of Exodus, who, when the people of God cried out and they were enslaved in Egypt, God heard their cry and liberated them. The God of liberation, the God who brings justice to the oppressed. That rendition invites us to reflect upon that liberation to be thankful for it, to live into it. To me, these are two great invitations as we think about Sabbath, as we have time apart, time of rest. How do we focus on God's good creation? And how do we lift up God as one who brings liberation for the oppressed? Their invitation to us. So whether that uh, gift of Sabbath is sitting on your front porch, Maybe it hasn't even been ordered yet because you didn't know it was a gift. Maybe it has been practiced in your life for 50, 70, 80 years. May we step into new ways of Sabbath, Sabbath rest and Sabbath practice as a community. Amen. Love to have the invitation for a few of you to share how you practice Sabbath in a line or two. Could also be ways we do this each week, realizing that the Holy Spirit speaks to all of us as a community not just to the one who speaks and shares, um, but it is a blessing when we are able to share that in our midst. Are there any who would be up for sharing their Sabbath practice? 
or frustration with Sabbath. Go ahead, Julie. All right. My Sabbath practice is to give God a day off. I try not to ask God for anything and be content with what I have. Um, so my prayer time is just Thanksgiving and praise. Mm. And Leah's got some. <laughs> uh, my Sabbath practice is to not make any plans and go with the flow. And thank you for sharing yours. Any others who have a day that's different? Someone has a, just unmute yourself if you do, if I don't see you. Yeah, Martha? No, don't. Martha says, I like to call and talk with family and friends that I miss, a time of connection, reconnection to others. Yeah, Susanna. Um, this is more a reflection, I guess, on uh, when I was growing up, we had pretty strict Sabbath practices we didn't go to restaurants, we didn't go shopping, we didn't um, do homework. <laughs> you just, uh, we ate together as a family after church and then pretty much everyone either took a nap or rest time. And I used to complain a lot about it <laughs> when I was growing up. Um, but then once I got to like high school, it became kind of freeing um, not to have to do any school or homework on Sundays. Um, and I would just figure out a way to do it other times. So if um, there was, you know, like a group project or something and other people wanted to work on Sunday, I had this, like I wasn't allowed to. So um, one, I could blame it on my parents, but also it became this freeing sort of thing. Um, and then I continued it actually when I went to college and I just wouldn't work on any school stuff on Sundays, even if I had big stuff coming up. And it reminds me of um, one of the painters that I, I, I really admire their painting practice, maybe not all of the aspects of their life, but this painter, Chuck Close, who uses a very strict um, process in the way that he makes paintings and uses a grid. And one of the things that he said is that in having um, rules and limitations, then he's able to find freedom within those rules and limitations. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think about how sometimes having um, a structure in place for the Sabbath, some sort of guidelines that you want to follow, then gives you freedom to do other things that otherwise you wouldn't have or to have a creativity about how you practice that day. Um, and so instead of seeing those um, structures as limitations, seeing those as opportunities for, um, freedom and creativity and rest that otherwise we wouldn't give ourselves. Amen. Yeah, Lorraine, I see your hand up. Uh, no big work projects starting on Sunday and absolutely no lawn work or yard work on Sundays. No yard work, is that no, what you said? Not on Sundays, no yard work on Sundays. Okay. And no big work projects. No big work projects, thanks for sharing. Yeah, Rosemary. Um, well, I'm a little confused on this. Um, because I, I was brought up that Sunday was the Lord's day, not the Sabbath. It was the Lord's day. And, um, and the Sabbath was like Saturday um, in the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but we did have, it, it was strict what we didn't do. Cause I can remember wanting to go to the park and play and not being able to go to the park and play because it was Sunday. But, yeah. but my parents always said, it's Sunday, it's the Lord's day not to say have it yeah some yeah christians have made that distinction over time um as well yeah thanks for sharing hello yes Faye. would you like to share your sabbath practice i grew up and my mother always had a fit because our neighbor always washed his car on the sabbath mm. <laughs> No car washing on the Sabbath. Couldn't play ball on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we could play games and I had religious types of games mm -hmm. to play. But I, of course, I, my father was a minister. So it was uh, foregone that uh, 
the Sabbath would be the Lord's day. And you did do on that day, you rested. Thanks for sharing. My hope is that uh, this scripture would guide us, um, that it would be more invitation than restriction, but it would be an invitation to a different day in the midst. Um, Linda would share some music with us. May we reflect on our practice, even thinking that today, the rest of the day as a Sabbath, what we may do to uh, recognize God as a creator and God as liberator. Here in this place, the new light is streaming. Now in the darkness, vanished away. See in the space, our fears and our dreaming. Brought here to you in the light of the day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for our face. We have been sung throughout all our history. We're called to be light in the light of this day. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so big and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the soul. Not in the dark of buildings confining. Not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place, the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, our people together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Running back and forth between sanctuary and session room. We appreciate your <laughs> juggling of all of that. Now we come to the communion table. Hopefully you have bread and elements um, with you, um, whatever that may be, something in front of you. You can get creative, whatever that is. I want us to remember an uh, old, old story of the Jewish people um, when they were in the desert and God brought them manna. Uh, if you remember, uh, each day they would uh, go out to collect what they needed. Um, if they collected extra, right, the next day it would go bad. Um, a, good, uh, a good lesson for us in uh, how much we need. Uh, but there was a practice, a gift from God, that on the sixth day they were allowed to uh, gather twice as much. And so they gathered twice as much, getting ready for uh, the Sabbath, getting ready for that day of rest. And the next day they found that it didn't go bad. Somehow, mysteriously, in God's way, um, they were provided for on that Sabbath. They were provided a way of rest. They did not have to gather. And I think about that as we come to the bread and the wine, as we come to the Passover meal, um, that Jesus was with uh, his disciples, with his friends. Uh, he took that bread and uh, broke it at the table, uh, reminding them that this would be uh, his broken body. Remind him that it would be the bread of life for them. He also took the cup at the end of the Passover meal, uh, saying to do this in remembrance of me, that this would be poured out as a new sign of the new covenant. So I invite you, as you are able, to take some of the bread. I like to dip it in the juice, remembering bread of life and the cup of living water. Take as the people of God.
Let us pray. God, we give thanks for the gift that you have extended to us, the gift of your life, your death, and your resurrection that we recognize in this bread and this juice. And also give you thanks for the gift of rest, the gift that you showed us within creation, that rhythm. God, we live within a society that greatly honors working and overworking and being busy. We ask that you would guide us in the difficult ways of how do we stop, how do we rest, how do we be a people that is inviting our larger society to better balance working when that work is a gift and to resting when the rest is a gift as well. Guide us as your people that we may be faithful in our lives as well as as a church. Give us new imagination uh, as we uh, practice this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Want to lift up a few things here. I think Bex can share the slides. We will pass our virtual plate right now uh, if you desire uh, as part of your discipleship to be giving and be generous um, with our church community. We know you are generous with many different people, many different organizations. Uh, we give thanks for that. But we do uh, invite if you desire um, to donate to our different ministries. We have a couple of announcements. The Bible study is always meeting on Wednesday night. I know we are in competition with uh, the president's address. Um, this week, I don't think we will be, so I invite you to join us. Always, it's a community of interpreters, um, interpreting, learning together, hopefully never staying in the first century of Acts, but always coming to today, making uh, connections, so please join us. Um, I think the Women's Circle might be meeting this week because it was pushed back last week. I think you all know that. Um, building the beloved community. We have a couple events coming up. Hopefully you can join us for that bystander intervention um, training, as well as we're going to have a, a meeting on the last Wednesday, um, uh, storytelling time about intersectionality, about all the different parts of our identities, all the different parts about our lives and how they interact with each other. Um, two specific announcements. We do have some needs for the food ministry. Um, we do need someone to help wash dishes on Monday afternoon. Um, this will be like 11.30 to 1.30 um, to come in and help wash. One of our volunteers, I think Paul, is out for a few weeks. Um, so if anyone would be willing to do that, you could raise your hand right now, or you could call Dorothy uh, or Bill and let them know, but that would be great. I am amazed. There's two volunteers, Brian and Paul, and they normally do the dishes. I'm amazed they do it after everyone's gone, but to support um, the ministry and the service. We also need someone, uh, Luis is uh, not able to, we need someone just to wash the towels um, for two weeks. So this will be on a Wednesday afternoon, come and get the towels and then wash them and bring them back. You don't have to see anyone, um, completely COVID safe. So if anyone would be willing to do that, you can let me know, you can raise your hand, you can message Dorothy. Um, hopefully you saw in the email, there is signups. If you would like to come and uh, visit with my family on a Sunday afternoon, there's three Sundays in May. We'd love to have you. Um, so far, it's not a hot ticket item. There's only one person signed up. So uh, maybe we'll send out an email or others would like to join us, but we'd love to sit in the backyard, socially distanced appropriately. We'll be both fully vaccinated by then. Um, we'd love to uh, have a, a different space and time to be able to get to know each other, but please uh, join if you are able. Receive God's blessing as we go to live as the church in the world. We are invited that God of creation, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has gifted us with rest, has gifted us with Sabbath or the Lord's Day. May we live into it, knowing that we follow one who created and brings liberation. Amen.